so I, I need to go ahead and give you a heads up. I don't have much of a voice this morning, so that's a gift to you because that means I can only preach as long as I can talk, which is probably not going to be for very long today. But I did want to start out by saying we're glad you're here today and that next week is going to be a really special Sunday because next Sunday is our third annual Go Day, and we're looking forward as a church family to uh, engaging in, uh, we've got four different awesome work projects. Uh, that several of our Connect Group leaders have lined up. And if you have not signed up and this is something that you're interested in being involved with, I don't normally encourage you to get your phones out during worship, but this would be a great time to do that if you want to scan that QR code. We serve a God who loves when his people go. And this is just a, a reminder for us as a church family that we are living on mission every day. And it's not just one day a year that we want to be a people who goes. We gather every week to go into our community. And one of the greatest ways that we shine our light for Jesus, one of the best ways that we live out the love that he's called us to and that we can show our devotion to him is by going. It's by doing acts of kindness that are going to bless other people. And so we've got different work projects of all different kinds of abilities and skill sets and ages. And so we think there's something for every person to be involved with. It'll only be maybe one to two hours worth of serving next Sunday afternoon after our morning service. You'll have time to eat lunch and then meet together as a group wherever you're going to be serving. And then next Sunday night, we're going to gather in our fellowship hall, share a meal together, and then just share stories of how we saw God uh, working through us and working around us. And we're just going to talk about the things that we experienced and the ways that, that we saw God move and work uh, as we were just simply giving a little bit of time to serving him. So I hope, if you have not already made plans, that you'll make plans for joining us for Go Day. Now, I told you God loves when his people go. In fact, the second book of the Bible is a story, a longer story about God getting his people to go somewhere. They were leaving Egypt where they had been enslaved for the past 400 years, and he's going to lead them ultimately to the promised land. And he didn't just take them out of there in a really quiet way. In fact, it was a very loud way that they left the land of Egypt. And so they're marching out of Egypt, and there's this massive nation that's grown up there, and they're on their way, and they get to the edge of the Red Sea, and they think that's a problem, and then God parts the Red Sea, and the Israelites walk through on dry ground, and Pharaoh's army was pursuing them, and everybody was stressed out, but they just turned around and watched as the waters came tumbling down upon Pharaoh's army, and just a reminder of God's providence and protection over them, and then they keep walking, and they're going to be on about a three-month journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God's going to invite them into this covenant relationship. He's going to engage, into them, engage with them and invite them into a relationship with him that no one else on the planet was going to get to experience at that time. And about a month into that journey, they started to get a little hangry. Has that ever happened to you? Anybody in the room get hangry? Uh, anybody live with somebody that gets hangry? Hangry. You know what I'm talking about. It's where you get a little hungry and you get a little irritable, a little, a little angry, and you start to complain. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. James referenced this story in his communion talk where finally they just, they just said it out loud. If only we had died in Egypt. And you're like, that escalated really quickly. Uh, they, they, were, they were ready to go. And here's why they said that. They said, you know, when we were in Egypt, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. And you're like, wait a minute. I've read that story before. They lived there as 400 years. And, and for a lot of those years, they were slaves. And, and I, I don't know much about slavery, but the one thing that I know that you don't do as slaves is just sit around and eat all the time. And isn't that a little bit of revisionist history? They're thinking something in their past that just simply didn't happened. They didn't sit around and eat whatever they wanted. Now, maybe it was, there was food prepared for them a little more often than they had been experiencing, but they are turning this thing up to another notch. And then they said, but you, and you can almost picture them pointing that finger, pointing to Moses, and Aaron, but really pointing to God, but you, you brought us out here, this entire assembly into the desert to starve to death. Have you ever found yourself in a spiritual desert? Because I think we can all find ourselves there. 
you know, it's, it's where you go through this season where your spiritual life is just not what it was. You've lost your motivation. You're not really engaging as much in prayer or reading scripture. Worship's become more of just a discipline and a grind than it is a joy. You're feeling distant from God. Maybe you're feeling distant from God's people. And you just find yourself in this really dry place, really spiritually dry place. It's like you don't feel like you're either your prayers are heard or you don't even want to lift them up because you, you just lost all the joy and the passion in your spiritual life. And there can be a number of circumstances as to why you get to that place. Maybe it's because just things have happened in life that have gotten to where your life feels like a wilderness. You feel like you're living in just utter chaos. There's all kinds of stuff going on at work, and it's just got you stressed out beyond all measure. Or maybe there's things going on in your family. Maybe it's relationship struggles. Maybe you're struggling financially to pay your bills. Maybe you're in that season of life where your kids are really little, I mean like really little, and you can't take your eyes off of them for a second, and you're just emotionally exhausted because you feel like you're living in a zoo. Or maybe there's just this calendar, and it's just one thing after another, meeting after meeting, work day after work day, just trying to keep your head above water. And all of those different things, maybe it's a season of life where you're just grieving and you've suffered loss, or all of a sudden there was a relationship that you had that came to an abrupt end, you're experiencing loneliness. There's all kinds of things that can happen to us that cause us to find ourselves in this spiritual desert. And we never intended to be there, but we just kind of wound up there. And then the question becomes, well, what do we do? What do you do when you feel like you don't really feel like it? Well, what the Israelites found when they found themselves in a spiritual desert, I think is significant, highly significant. Because the next thing that happens in Exodus chapter 16, even after they've accused God of trying to kill them, God provides a table. He said, I'll rain down bread from heaven for you. He doesn't cast them all. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. He provides for them. And so, starting last week, we began this series called Come to the Table. And I told you last week that the idea of the table is something that goes all throughout the story of Scripture, all the way back to one of the origin stories of the nation of Israel. Even in the midst of their complaining, even in the midst of their accusations, even in the midst of their distrust, God said, come to the table. And so even in the wilderness, there's this invitation to come to the table. Even when you feel spiritually dry, even when God feels a thousand miles away, even when you're struggling just to engage in spiritual habits and spiritual disciplines, even when you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're like, you know, I don't really feel like going today, God still says, come to the table. He always invites us in. So I want to give you a couple of things, two things I want to encourage you to remember, and then two things I want to challenge each of us to do when we find ourselves in a spiritual desert. The first thing that we need to remember is that even in the desert, God is present, even though we can't see him. That's the one thing the Israelites needed to be reminded of. And here's the thing. They could see the presence of God. They could see his presence in the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that was leading them. But they had felt like in some capacity, God had abandoned them. He said, you brought us out here to starve to death. They felt like God had abandoned them, but he, hadn't, he had not done that. He was with them every step of the way. He was testing their faith in some capacity, but he wanted to invite them in to completely depend on him. There's this story later in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 19, one of God's prophets named Elijah. In 1 Kings 18, he has this amazing moment, this mountaintop experience where he has defeated and God has shown up in a powerful way, and he defeated 450 prophets of Baal. All these false prophets, it was 450 against one. Jonathan, that's seriously what it was like yesterday playing James and his granddaughters, like 450 against two. Brandon and I gave our hearts in that game. We just couldn't, couldn't get over the top. And so after that mountaintop experience on Mount Carmel, Elijah runs because he's fearing for his life. And he flees to this remote cave. 
And he cries out to God, feeling abandoned by all of his people, even sort of feeling abandoned by God. And he said, I'm the only one that's trying to live faithfully for you. And so then these series of things happened. There was an earthquake, but God's presence wasn't in the earthquake. There was this fire that kind of ripped through the mountains, and God wasn't in the fire. And a, 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 almost like a tornado kind of rips through. God wasn't in that. It was a really weird scene. And I'm sure Elijah had to be really confused. And it just reminds me of those times where I find myself in a spiritual desert, and I'm like, God, just... Just show up, God, I, I need to see that you're still with me. And we look for it in really big ways. Like, God, if you're here, just like strike lightning right now, and that'll let me know that you're here. God doesn't really function that way. In fact, it was this really soft, gentle breeze. Some would say you could describe it as a whisper, just this gentle little wind that brushed right across his face. And he hears this whisper and he instantly recognizes that's the presence of God. Because that's actually how God functions. That's how he operates. When we can't see him, it's that soft little breeze. It's that subtle little reminder. I'm with you every step of the way. And as a result, what he does is he provides. But he doesn't provide in the way that we expect him to. But he always gives us exactly what we need. In the story in Exodus... He told them to get up every day and to go out and gather enough for that day, enough of the bread just for that day. And it was, a, it was this little test to just get what they needed for that day. Then on the Sabbath day, they were going to gather twice as much because on, uh, or the day before the Sabbath, they would gather twice as much because on the Sabbath day, they weren't going to go out and gather. And you just think about that idea and picture yourself, you're the Israelites, you're wandering through the desert. And God says, go out every day and gather enough for the day. But what about tomorrow? I mean, what's going to happen tomorrow? Have you ever found yourself in this chaotic season of life? And you're not just worried about today, but you're worried about tomorrow. Because if things don't change today and things don't change tomorrow, when are things going to change? And we get a little impatient, just like the Israelites did. They didn't want to go out and just gather enough for the day. They wanted a feast. They wanted every day there to be plenty but yet God said, I'll give you exactly what you need. He gave them this little bit of bread. We'll talk at the very end about what it was. It's just, it was perfect for what they needed. It provided the nourishment. It provided the calories. And it was light enough to carry. They didn't need to take with them a month's worth of food for that many people. That would have been a burden to carry. And every day, just take what you need for today. And James, I appreciate him referencing this. We chatted a little bit about what he did awesome with time together, and I really appreciate him pointing this out. This line in the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus prayed, give us today our daily bread. And just as James mentioned, that bread, that phrase daily bread, it's, it's representative. Yeah, it, it can stand for God, give me today the physical nourishment that I need to survive this day. But I want to put before you that I believe that that phrase, daily bread, is actually a little bit more than just bread physically. That that daily bread becomes representative of whatever it is that I need today to get through today. Whether that be the extra measure of grace that I need, whether that be the extra measure of patience that I need, whether that be the extra measure of trust that I need, that that becomes representative of whatever it is we need when we find ourselves in that spiritual desert. It might just be I need a, a little bit extra measure of presence to know that God is with me, just to get through the next moment, the next step, the next several hours, the next 24 hours. And I'm not going to worry about what tomorrow's bread needs are going to be because Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to worry about itself. There's enough to focus on for today. So what is it that you need today? What is that daily bread that you need God to provide for you today? Because he promises to provide, not, not what you think you need. Praise God, he knows exactly what we need. 
And it's rarely what we expect. You ever gone to prayer praying for something and you already had the answer in mind? You gave a request to God, God, can you work this situation out? But you already had a really good plan of how that would work out best, and that's rarely how God operates. He usually doesn't give us exactly what we want because that's actually sometimes the worst thing that could ever happen. But he works it out exactly how we need. And then we look back on that situation and we say, God, thank you for that daily bread. Because I wasn't really understanding what I need. So here's two things I want to challenge you to do when you find yourself in that spiritual desert. Just to remind yourself of the value and the, the power in the invitation to come to God's table. The first one is you've got to gather manna daily. Now Jesus said that every, or excuse me, let me back up. Jesus said that we are not to live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now he said that in the context of being tempted by the devil and being tempted to only focus on his physical needs. And Jesus said, life is more than just physical it's spiritual as well. And so that, that command, that charge, that encouragement that God gave to Israel every day, walk out of your tent and go get what you need. Every day, rain or shine, cold or hot, motivated or unmotivated, every day you got to get up and you got to go out of the tent and you got to get what you need for the day. Because if you don't, then you're going to lack what you need that day. I'll put before you, that for us to gather manna daily is to every day get into God's word, even if it's just a little bit. Because when we start skipping those moments, what we're doing is we're allowing Satan to plant lies into our hearts. He does it through a variety of ways. Modern culture, social media, things other people tell us commercials, somebody's post, just thoughts that creep into our minds, negative, uh, self-negative talk that we give to ourselves. And he's just filling our minds with lies. And here's the dangerous thing. The longer you hear a lie, the more you believe it's true. And if we're not regularly going out to get our manna, if we're not allowing the word of God to speak truth into our life daily, then we will allow those lies to grab hold of our hearts and we'll believe them. Yet God said, rain or shine, hot or cold, motivated or unmotivated, you got to get the manna. You got to be in the word every day. And here's the second thing. We got to be in spiritual community. There seems to be this connection between spiritual disconnection and physical disconnection. Here's what I mean by that. When we find ourselves in that season of spiritual disconnection where God feels distant, sometimes it creates a physical disconnection between me and God's people. Because when I feel disconnected from God, I lose my motivation. And I notice that, maybe you've noticed that your behavior patterns start to change. And you wake up on a Sunday, and you're not near as motivated. And so you miss a week. And because you're disconnected, then it's two weeks, then a month, then two months. And before you know it, you've created a whole new habit of behavior. And you didn't feel like going, so you didn't. But what you didn't realize is that spiritual disconnected connection caused a physical disconnection. And it isolates you, and it makes you vulnerable even more to the attacks of the enemy. But one of the things that God told the Israelites to do is to gather enough, not just for themselves, but for the community. It was a communal event. They all went out every day and gathered man. It wasn't one person's responsibility. It wasn't just the leader's responsibility. It was every individual's responsibility to get up as a community and to take care of one another and to make sure that the one who couldn't gather as much had just exactly what they need. It was all about community. And I'd put before you that one of the reasons why the church in Acts 2 grew so much is because they stayed in spiritual community. They gathered around tables. 
You see, it's not just about sitting in a room together on a, on a weekly basis, because here's what I know is true about us as people. You can sit in a room with the same people every week and feel alone. I know that that's true. I've experienced it, and many of you have as well. Now, what we are doing is good and right and holy, and God calls us to do this. What he also calls us to do is engage in spiritual community, and that involves gathering around one another's tables. This invitation to come to the table is to engage in relationship. It's to find places in one another's lives. We can say, you know what? I'm struggling. I feel so far from God. My life is just completely out of sorts. I've allowed this addictive behavior to creep in. I'm struggling with this sin. I'm dealing with these lies that my mind keeps believing that I've got to shake. Whatever it is, we've got to have that community, that group of people that we can feel safe to say, can you pray for me? Can you help me go through what I'm going through without judging and just being a confident presence in my life and remind me of the presence of God in my life? And that takes place in community. And there's something powerful about tables. I haven't totally put my finger on it aside that God knows exactly what it is because it's been a part of his plan since the beginning of time. It's a, it's a theme that runs all throughout, the te- all throughout the scriptures. As early as Genesis and all through the very end of the story of the Bible in the book of Revelation, the table continues to just roll through the story because they're transformative places when we gather around tables. So my challenge to you as you as I encourage you to stay in spiritual community, is this month to schedule a time to invite some people to join you at your table. Whether that's the table at your house or place you stay, whether that's a table at a restaurant, whether that's a picnic table at the park, whether that's a couple of families after church on a Sunday morning in the fellowship, my challenge to you is engage in community around a table. Because powerful things happen when we share bread together. Because that's exactly the way that God planned for it to be. So, the story finishes that they looked toward the desert. And there, there, did you catch that? They looked toward the desert. And there was the glory of the Lord. And what I understand from that to mean for you and I is that when you look back on that moment of spiritual dryness there you will see the glory of the Lord there you will see God providing for you and staying present with you even when you felt like he was so far away because he's just right there He's right there in the middle of your doubt. He's right there in the middle of your struggle. He's right there in the middle of your chaos. He's right there in the middle of nowhere because he's been right where he's always been, faithfully with us every step of the way. And so when they saw the dew was gone, there were these thin flakes like frost, frosted flakes. Anybody catch that? On the ground, on the desert floor. And the Israelites saw it and they said to one another, what what is this? Isn't that awesome as a cook when you put dinner on the table and the people you're cooking for walk in and they go, what is this? Uh, They didn't know what it was. By the way, that phrase, what is this? That's where the word manna comes from. It's what it means. The word manna means, what is this? They didn't recognize it. It was unfamiliar. And then Moses said, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Do you hear the connection? We just had communion a few minutes ago where we were reminded of the bread the Lord had given us to eat. Because in Luke 22, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to them. But he said, this bread, this bread is my body given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. When we come together around tables, when we take bread or meat or steak 
when we're just engaging in good spiritual community and relationships. And we give thanks for that. We're reminding one another of this spiritual bond that God has created within each of us. This power of community. This need that we have to be together. And whether that be around the Lord's table breaking the bread and the fruit of the vine, or whether that be in a restaurant, in a park eating pizza, doing whatever it is, but engaging around a table and sharing our lives with one another. We're reminding each other that what we're doing is possible because of the one who gave everything for us. So the next time you find yourself around the table, and I hope it'll be this month with some of your brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you'll just have this moment as you break that bread or whatever it is that you're enjoying together. And just thank God that you have people in your life that are there for you through the thin. If you don't, if you don't have people like that in your life, you're in the space for that to happen. And it's a powerful opportunity for us to open our hearts, to become a little vulnerable, and to invite people into our lives. Hey, Will you join me at my table? Because we serve a God who even in the midst of all of our chaos, knowing how sinful we are and will be, even in our grumbling and in our accusations, said, come to the table. That's representative of a relationship. He's inviting us to come near. So if you're here this morning, I hope you hear the Lord's invitation. He's saying, come. Come with your doubts. Come with your sins. Come with all of your chaos. And he promises to redeem every bit of it and to offer you forgiveness. His invitation is to come. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, but you've drifted from God, you've, you're living in this spiritual desert, he's carrying you through it. But maybe one of the things that you need to do is to just confess that that's where you are and to invite some people into your life to help you navigate that season by the Lord's help so that you don't feel alone because you're not. God's with you and we want to be as well. So if we can encourage you in any way, please let that be known as together we stand and sing.